Okay, so this is our online video for Introduction to Biology. First here we have a list of our objectives. At the beginning of every online video you will always see a list of these objectives. This is what you should be able to explain by the end of the online video. This also matches the objectives that are on those You Gotta Know sheets which tell you what you are going to be tested on. Remember because it's an online video you can always pause, rewind, and go back and forth within the video to check out these objectives and make sure you're understanding them as you go along. So first we're going to talk about characteristics of living things because obviously biology is the study of life and we define any living thing as an organism and as you can see in this diagram here organisms have a lot of diversity okay in this picture uh, in the top left corner we have bacteria uh, you see we have a, a spider there we have koala we have some mushrooms uh, some frogs um, you know, all living things, very big, very small, um, all different shapes, sizes, and different uh, life strategies. So now the question is, well, if biology is the study of life, what makes something living? Where do we draw the line between whether it is living or non-living? And you might think it's more black and white than that, but there's actually a pretty big gray zone. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in class. So first thing is, if you're going to be living, you have to be made of cells. And it can be one cell. In that case, you are a unicellular organism, for example, like the paramecium here on the left side. Uh, or you can be made of many cells, which would be multicellular. Uh, and as humans, you know, we're made of over a trillion cells now is what they estimate. So you can get very large. And there's a benefit to that, being uh, multicellular versus being unicellular. And the benefit is that you can start assigning different cells to do different jobs. And so we call that cell specialization. And basically what that means is different cell types can have different functions. So if we take a look at this diagram on the bottom here, what they're showing you in the center is that an egg and a sperm fertilize each other during uh, reproduction and we have the start of a new multicellular life. As the cells divide from that point, they give rise to groups of cells that have different functions. For example, your red blood cells are required uh, to carry oxygen through your blood and that's necessary for uh, acquiring and using energy, uh, whereas your bone tissue are going to help you grow your bones and allow for that calcification that needs to happen to give your body structure, um, whereas your intestinal epithelial cells, that's going to aid you in digesting your food and processing and absorbing nutrients. So each of those cell types can have different functions, and these are just a few that are found in our human body. The second thing that makes you living is the fact that you need and require energy. And that's because in order to do all of the things in your body, you are going to be using chemical reactions. So we call this your metabolism. So metabolism is the way that you build up and break down molecules as they're needed in your body. And that's how we're going to transfer energy from one form to another. Uh, if you look on the left here, there are some groups of organisms that we call producers and they are going to take in energy from the sun and they are going to convert it or transfer it into a form of food energy such as glucose. Uh, but if you're a consumer, you can't take in energy from the sun, so how are you going to get that energy? Uh, you're going to have to consume it. Okay, and so in order to get their glucose, they're going to need to eat something, whether it's another plant or a producer, uh, or, you know, in the picture with uh, the lions there, it looks like they've tackled a caribou. You can eat other uh, animals as well, other consumers. And that's, we'll talk about the food chain when we get into ecology a little later. All living things need to be able to respond to their environment. Okay, and we experience this on a daily basis. In fact, first thing in the morning, I'm sure you respond to your environment because at, you know, 6.05 a.m., all of a sudden, 
there comes, you know, some tune on your cell phone, and that is your alarm. And you hear that, and your body takes in that information, and it says, oh, it's time to get up. So you have the ability to interact with your environment through sound in that way. Two of the most important ones are definitely going to be light and temperature. So here you see there's a bright sun, okay, and is giving off lots of light. Okay, let's look at light for our example. In this top corner here, okay, we look at the eye, and the eye has a physiological response. Right? Your pupil has the ability to change size to control the amount of light that is coming into the eye. So here on this side of the eye, where we don't see the, uh, the light being forced into it, the pupil is large and relaxed, okay? But once we shine a bright light at the eye, the pupil, it closes down, okay? So it's almost like a shutter in a way. It goes smaller to prevent the eye from receiving too much light because that's overstimulation. And you know that sometimes that can almost make you feel like you're blinded by the sunlight. Okay? We also can have behavioral responses. For example, this guy down here, he's squinting. Okay? That's another way you can reduce the amount of light by physically closing your eyelids or putting your hand up here by shading uh, the amount of light that is coming into your eyes. You can also do things like putting on sunglasses or, you know, the brim of a hat or just simply moving out of the light. So there are lots of different ways that we can respond as humans. Plants have a different response to light. Plants need light in order to perform photosynthesis to make their food. And so when plants are exposed to light, we actually see that they engage in a behavior. You can see how all of these little seedlings are bending in one direction well, they are all bending towards wherever the light is coming from. So the light rays are coming in on this side here, and all of the plants are bending that way in order to absorb the most light energy. All living things have the ability to reproduce, okay? So this is mating. And the important part about this is actually that we need to pass on our genetic information. That is the purpose of reproduction. And that genetic information is called DNA. Um, so what's so special about the DNA molecule? It contains the recipe for how organisms are to grow and develop. It's sort of like an instruction manual for everything that you need to make in your body. And DNA is just an abbreviation, but it stands for this big long word, deoxyribonucleic acid. And really the word just describes what molecules it's made of and how it's put together. So different living things have different ways of reproducing. Okay, down here, this is an example. This is showing a hydra, and it's showing asexual reproduction. Because you see this guy right here? This is actually not part of the hydra. This is a new baby hydra that is sort of growing right off the side of the adult hydra. We call this budding. Since all of the genetic information for this new baby hydra only comes from this one adult hydra, we call that asexual reproduction. And so it's going to be an exact identical copy as far as genetic information goes. But when we look over here, this is a jawfish, okay? This jawfish has mated with another jawfish to produce all of these baby eggs. Um, and so what has happened there is we have a combination of genetic information between the two adults, and that is going to produce some more diversity uh, and unique combinations of genetic information in each one of these eggs. So these eggs will not be identical to one another. So those are the key things that all living things uh, uh, have as a characteristic. But even going beyond that, there are some themes that we want to talk about in biology. We're going to see them pop up over and over again. Okay, The first theme, all levels of life have system of related parts. Okay, In other words, little things build up to make bigger things. All right, And when we look at this diagram here, it starts with the littlest thing on a chemical level. You can talk about an atom, and you should have learned about atoms in middle school, right? So here's an example of a, a hydrogen atom and uh, an oxygen atom, and they're going to form a water molecule, okay? Molecules are going to build together to start making parts of cells. For example, the nucleus, that we call that an organelle. 
and then that nucleus is going to be one of the organelles that makes up a cell. And actually, right here, the cell is a very important level of organization in life because the cell is the smallest unit of something that can still be considered its own living thing. So if you have just an organelle, like just a nucleus, that is not considered its own living thing. You start here at the cell level, and we know lots of single-celled organisms that are considered their own living thing. So that means all of life has to be made up of at least one or more cells. And as you can see, we can go up through these levels of organization, and we include parts of each level going into the next level. For example, you have lots of different body tissues that come together to form an organ, and lots of organs that form organ systems, and all of those organ systems create a single organism. But you can go beyond that, because you can look at a population of organisms, and then how that population interacts with other populations to form a community, how those communities interact with other non-living factors of, uh, of the earth, like sunlight and water and air temperature. And that gets us all the way up to the level of the biosphere, or they call it the ecosphere in this diagram, which is uh, the planet Earth and all of its living and non-living things. Okay, So systems of related parts. The next theme, and this is a really big one, we're going to talk about this a lot. The structure of something and its function are going to be related. So the structure is basically its shape uh, or the form of something, and that's going to determine how it is used or what it can do. So I have two really great examples here. Okay, Your lungs are shaped in such a way so that you can bring in oxygen and you can exhale carbon dioxide. And that needs to travel throughout your body. So inside your lungs, you have these cute little tiny air sacs. And they're all wrapped in their own membrane. And they are called alveoli. Okay, And each alveolus is going to have its own membrane. And it's going to be wrapped very close to a blood vessel. And what that blood vessel does is it has a semi-permeable membrane. In other words, it allows for gases to move between the alveoli and the blood vessels very easily. So why have all these tiny little air sacs inside of your lung, which is one big air sac? Well, the more contact you have with these blood vessels, the higher the rate of exchange for your gases. So by having all of these individually wrapped little air sacs, that's going to allow much more uh, oxygen getting in and carbon dioxide getting out at a faster rate. So we say that we're increasing the surface area of the lungs, and that's going to definitely aid the function of breathing and getting those materials cycled through your body. Here's another example. Hemoglobin is an important protein that your body makes. And its job is specifically to carry oxygen molecules while on red blood cells. And this is a computer model. But what it's trying to show you is that a protein is this long chain of amino acids that are linked together. It sort of looks like a beaded necklace. And then it's twisted and folded in a very specific way. So now its shape okay, is going to play a role in how well it can hold oxygen. Well, sometimes people have a mutation in that protein formation. And what that causes is a change in the shape. You see how this is sort of, uh, it, it looks longer and it, it's not as condensed. You see the yellow pieces aren't coming together at the top. They're off to the sides. Because it's a different shape, it doesn't function the same way. And as you notice, there are no red spots in here. Um, and so what's happening is, we're losing our pockets for where we're going to carry oxygen. And so people who have the disease sickle cell anemia, uh, they have a protein that has lost its shape, and therefore it has also lost its function. So we're going to talk a lot more about structure and function. Uh, organisms must maintain homeostasis in order to survive in diverse environments. So what is homeostasis? Homeostasis is being able to control or maintain a constant internal environment. And probably the most important example I can think of is your body temperature. So as an animal, uh, you know, you're a mammal, 
you are going to be able to control your body temperature no matter what the outside temperature is like so let's say we're outside like this girl here and we're playing a game of tennis and the sun is beating down upon us and we're running all over the tennis court it's getting really hot in addition to that our body is giving off heat on the inside because all of the energy that we're requiring to run around that court is also giving off some heat as a byproduct. So there's a lot of excess heat in our body, and as a result of that, our temperature is rising. And if you remember, the normal temperature for your body is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 37 degrees Celsius. Okay? So what happens when that body temperature starts going up and up and up? Well, if we couldn't control it, we could die. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go through the year and we talk about the role of enzymes in chemical reactions, but that's for another lesson. Um, but the result of letting our temperature go too high could be death. So we need a way to control it. And so what happens is the blood flow to the surface of your skin is going to increase and it's going to allow that heat to be released from the surface of the skin. In addition to that, you open up tiny pores in the surface of your skin to release sweat and all that sweat is is water that's holding on to that heat that's inside of your body so as you release that water you're releasing the heat with it as well and that's going to allow your body temperature to cool back down And again the purpose of this is we want to maintain a constant internal environment so we don't want the temperature going way way down but we want to bring it back to this set point, 98.6 degrees. So think about what would happen if you were too cold. Can you think about how you might uh, do something in your body that will help to rise the temperature again? You would shiver. Yeah, by shivering, you're creating all these little muscle contractions, and those give off heat. In addition to that, you get goosebumps, okay? Has anyone ever told you what goosebumps are? Goosebumps are really just the acting of the little tiny muscles that hold your hairs and it causes them to hold your hair straight up so that as they fall again the hope is that they will trap some heat and bring it close to the surface of your skin to warm you so temperature is just one example of something that we uh, maintain in our bodies we also maintain a balance of blood sugar we maintain a balance of uh, carbon dioxide uh, and a number of other things water as well is a really important one all right, and the last thing we're going to talk about today is evolution. Um, this is always something that's really difficult to explain. A lot of people come in with a preconceived idea of what evolution means. We're going to spend a lot of time closer to the end of the year talking about evolution. But what's most important is evolution can explain the unity and the diversity that we see in all living things. And all evolution means is that living things will change over time. One of the pressures that's causing these changes over time are the environment. And so what's going to happen is organisms are going to become more fit to their environment through natural selection. Um, so the, the best example I can show you here is, let's take a look down here. This is an insect, and this is not an insect. This is actually the thorn on the side of a stem of a plant. Do you notice anything about these two? Yeah, they look really similar. And so what has happened is, over time, nature has selected for this insect to look more and more like this thorn. What might be the advantage in that way? Well, probably it provides a protection from predators because if you were a predator and you were you know, hunting to look to eat little insects, you might pass over this insect because you might think it's just a thorn on the side of a stem. <laughs> Excuse me. So that provides an advantage because that means this guy is more likely to survive than another insect that looks less like a thorn. Uh, and so natural selection or nature is going to choose what traits are best given the environment that we live in. Okay. But when we look at some characteristics, we share a lot of characteristics, okay? And we can point to our genetic code or our DNA to see the fact that we contain a lot of genes that are very similar across many different organisms. So what does that imply? That implies a unity of all organisms, that we're all linked together 
uh, through this tree of life. And so let me come over here. I want to zone in on this diagram here. Okay, what we see is we see the tree of life, and it's showing what looks like a tree, right? We can see the main trunk and then branches and then it branching off into smaller branches. And what it's trying to show you is that all living things can be organized into some part of this tree. And the, what they are implying is if you look back to the base of the tree, then that all living things share a common ancestor. So there's a relatedness between all life, whether you are a human, bacteria, a, a mushroom, a koala bear, whether you are this orchid that is mimicking the way that one of its pollinator wasps look in order to entice it and trick it to come and pollinate this plant. Um, we all share certain characteristics and that leads us to uh, the unity that all organisms uh, on earth share. So this is just a short introduction. Uh, this is the end of the video. So if you want, go back to those objectives at the beginning, read through them, and make sure that you understand them. Again, if you have any questions, you can always email the teacher uh, or you can ask in class.